It's 1X heavy. For the panfish version, I have the pre-cut bodies. Let me get, and what I found out in making the body for the bass version, if you look at this and hold it up to the hook, the apex of this body or the widest portion is like one and a half times the hook gap. So you could take a piece of foam, cut a strip about one and a half times the hook gap, and then the body itself is just slightly longer than the hook. And just make a, a double, like a diamond shaped, a long elongated diamond. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do for the bass version. I just cut it freehand. And you know, it's pretty much the same. I should get a ruler real quick. I think I have one right next to me. No. So for the size eight three X hook, the body is about an inch and an eighth long and a half inch wide. And I can demonstrate cutting it on the larger pattern because that's exactly what I'm going to do. Hey, these foam cutters are a lot of fun. You can sit there and spit them out, you know, 100 in an hour easily. But here is the bass hook, and here you can see the foam strip I cut for it. And I'm just going to take and measure it the length of the hook shank, fold it in half. And that's the length of my body. So I'll cut that and I already have the portion. So I'll just start making two lateral cuts and there's the body. A little crude, but it worked. And I'd say getting the body cut first is probably the most important part. And then you can start tying the fly. And this, like any other fly, you just start by wrapping the hook shank back to the point. And I found that by going back and forth once or twice, creating kind of like a cross hatching pattern kind of helps keep everything on this hook with this big chunk of foam. So now I have my hook with the thread back near the barb or really at the point. Then we can start putting the tail on. There's not a lot to this. So I'm gonna use Um, Congo hair, because I just have tons of this synthetic hair. And you want the tail to be, I find, slightly shorter than the shank. So I'm going to measure that. And I have that length in my fingers now, in my material fingers. Bring it up here and bring it almost, stretch it out till it's almost to the to the eye, a little behind it, and that's where I'm gonna cut it. So now I have material that's gonna hang over past the hook barb about a hank shank length and then cover all the hook shank to give that foam something to hold on to. Then I have that on top of the hook with the material to length, maybe a little less than a full hook shank length. So you have a little bit of the hook, point, hook uh, shank exposed in the front. 
and I have it pinched between my non-tying fingers and I'm just gonna do two light pinch wraps or two or three to hold it in place. Then go ahead and tie it down with pinch wraps all the way down the hook shank and really bind it down because this is the base that holds that foam in place. So everybody got that? So when you said that the, the uh, Congo hair extends just slightly past the, the hook bend. It's a little, little less than a shank length. So okay. what I'm doing is here's my Congo hair. So I'm going to measure using the hook shank, a little less than a full shank length, hold that behind the bar okay. gotcha. and then hold it up and cut it off right where the thread begins on the hook. So I have a piece that's like one and three quarter shank lengths because we want to cover the shank with this fur and have a tail that's not quite as long as the hook. Got you. Thank you. Lugel tend to short strike. So you want something not real long, not like a bass. A bass, you can, you can give them a long tail, though I don't really like doing that. Okay, everybody there? All right, now we're gonna tie in the legs. And so I'm using silly legs, but any kind of rubber legs will work. And each individual strand of a silly leg is about five inches long. I'm gonna take that and fold it in half and cut it in half. And my thread, is up here where we tied in the body material towards the front of the hook. And I'm just gonna fold those over the thread, get the ends pretty even. I mean, this isn't super critical, but mine need to be, mine got all out of place. So let me reorganize those. I'll fold them over the thread You have to excuse me, I have mechanics hands today. And bring them up to the hook and lightly put a couple wraps on them. Nothing super tight yet. And now they're gonna be sitting on there. Like that. They're just kind of loosely on there, any old direction they wanna be. Then you're gonna take and gather them like that, pull them back and wrap over top of them a couple times. And that'll get them oriented towards the back. And now you can take and make sure you have two strands on each side. Can you see that? There's two strands here and two strands there. You can, you can really orient these once you put the foam on, but we're just trying to get them two legs on each side, kind of folded towards the back. Then we'll take the thread behind them. And this is a little tricky. And advance the thread right back to where you tied the fur bundle in or a tail like that. So now the thread is back here, right above the point. Can you see that? Wayne, did you lock up? My screen was showing his bandwidth is going low. He may not have enough uh, enough juice to get through this.
I understand technology. <laughs> I've had my problems. <laughs> Not with a new laptop. <laughs> He'll come back. Knowing that what we know now, we would have the club would have bought your new laptop a couple months ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got it. You know, I still got the old one, but I, you know, I, I'm careful what I do because I know it's going to going to stop. Now he's back again. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, you froze up there. I, I got a, a post audio or a post video review request. <laughs> You haven't finished like, yet. Yeah, like, wait a minute. I haven't finished yet. <laughs> okay, we got our legs tied on. We've got the thread back near the barb where we tied in our tail. And we have the body here that we poked the hole through. And the pre-cut bodies have a little... Where did you poke the hole, Wayne? Sorry. I'm sorry, what? Where's the, where do you poke a hole in it? I missed that part. Okay, so you take the body, uh -huh. fold it over, and that creates a crease that's going to be the front of your fly. And then in that right. crease, in the center, you just poke a little hole. So I don't know if you okay. can see there's a hole in there. Let me take my scissors and right there. All right, gotcha. Thank okay, you. and if you have the pre-cut body, the side with the tab or the little tab on the end goes on the top and you just push it on like that. So now you have the foam body sitting on there with the tab <coughs> on top. Can you see that? And now what we're going to do is tie that tab down and watch your legs. They want to get in the way and just put a couple wraps on that to lock it in. And the body's attached. Then you're going to flip it over like that. And we're gonna super glue it shut. I like to use brush on super glue, but any super glue will work. And I just brush the whole underside of the body that's facing the hook. Get my legs where I want them. Pinch that down and hold it. And while you're doing this, if you want to reorient your legs, reorient your legs. Everybody see that? I'm gonna turn the light off in the back. I feel like I don't have enough contrast. Is that better? I lose everybody? No. no. Okay. I just hadn't heard any comments. So the fly is almost done. Um, it's a little tricky to finish in the back. So here's kind of a lazy, easy way to tie off. Just take the last inch or so of your thread and put a little super glue on it. And go ahead and wrap that thread around the foam.
I got a leg there. Make sure your legs are where you want them. You're done. So Don't really so need the wet finish. The super glue actually glues the thread down. So that's it. So you're really not tying the bottom portion of the foam with no, the, the glue all. holds it in place. Um, okay. Okay. I was just thinking if if you did it and still had a little tab on it, you would know. You, you yeah, would really I'm kind of surprised in. that it only has a tab on one side. You would think you'd want a tab on both sides. Yeah, I thought I was going to build one. That's what I would do. Yeah. Yeah, to give it some strength. But right, you know, there's so much surface area here because it's a triangle. Right. These things aren't going anywhere. It's like right. I have a couple more that I've already done, and they're pretty tough little devils they will if you torque on them real hard they will spin on the hook but they're very easy to reorient and right. with any of the folded foam bugs i've seen that to be very typical they will eventually as they get real wet start to spin on the hook shank and you just straighten them back out um, I, I, I always uh I, I never, I never thought super glue was really, it's water resistant, isn't it? It's not waterproof. Yeah, it seems to hold up quite well. Yeah. Um, I think over time it might, yeah. but I have some of the little size 10, I used to do the gurgle pop mm -hmm. and I would fish one all summer long. The only time I would change one is when I lost it. Okay. Um, okay. And they, they seem to hold up. Um, this is a much more robust piece of foam. So all right. All right. You know, maybe, maybe it won't. Um, even this, well, the Stealth Bomber type folded foam has a lot more thread to it. Yeah. And a lot more base on the hook shank itself to hold things in place. The yeah. problem I find with that pattern is it looks really, really good, but um, it tends to twist a lot in the water. Right. Um, and which to me makes it kind of not as if, I have not figured out how to get it to not twist because it does a great job of really disturbing the water, but it just, you know, it twists up your leader. Um, then your leader gets all coiled and then you go to cast. And the next thing you know, your bug is catching the leader. All right. Even with a really stiff one, it still tends to really, it's almost like you need a swivel. Yeah, I can see, I can see this fly after, after three or 400 bluegills, it probably gets pretty raggy. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say that's probably an effective fly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Anything you can catch three or 400 fish on, that's, yep. uh, that's okay by me. Uh, exactly. It's like I'll tie a dozen, and usually of like a topwater pattern for like bluegill or bass, and use maybe three right. a year. And then, you know, then I promptly lose them and do tie a dozen more that spring. Because uh, I can't remember where I put uh, them. I've all, I, you know, I should have put that in my book. You know, I just finished this tying book, and I, and I had a friend of mine that you know, if he lost one fly, tied six more. So you know, before he before he knows that he's got three or four dozen, <laughs> and then you can't find them. That's uh, where yeah. you put them, <laughs> and then you actually you have six dozen. <laughs> yep. And um, then you find them and set them somewhere. Uh -huh. And I do this every year. Yeah, I did that to my cicada flies. You know, you know, again, I didn't need them for 17 years. And I said, where'd I put them? I knew I put them someplace where I could, you know, I could get to them. And I, uh, I have some somewhere too. Yeah, it took me I days. Have no to idea them. where they are. <laughs> and and they're they're very, very similar to your pattern. Uh-huh. Um, but where they are, I you know, I tied a dozen <laughs> of them. Yeah, I, I the yeah. brood, this was probably 10 years ago, and it really didn't make it to Southern Maryland. I think it got into parts of Northern and Western Maryland. Right. And it made it into Northern Virginia. Um, but yeah, it didn't make it uh, down where I live. So. Right. so that's the panfish version. And the bass version is just really bigger. So for the bass version, I just picked the size one must add 3366 because it was on my bench. You might want to tie it, you know, on a 1-0 if you want something a little bigger. But on this one, again, I took the foam and it's about one and a half, the width of the foam strip is about one and a half times the gape of the hook. And in this case, the hook gapes about a half inch 
and the material width is three quarters of an inch. And there's my first bug body I, I just cut a few minutes ago. It ends up being about an inch and three quarters long. So three quarters wide, inch and three quarters long. So you end up with a rectangle like this. And then I'm just going to fold it in half lengthwise and then make two diagonal cuts almost but not quite to the center. So I end up with a little bit more of a square end and you can see this one foam wasn't very cooperative. So I'll just go in there and kind of clean it up. I think my Walmart scissors are just about done. <laughs> but I bought these at Walmart. They're titanium coated and they're like they were like eight bucks and they're curved. And I don't know why I just really like tying with them. I have all these really expensive scissors and I use these the most. And they're probably 10 years old. So we've got our body. I need to get my laptop higher. Um, and we're going to start this just like we did the others, just bigger. And in this case, I really put down some layers of thread on this. So I wrapped back to the point all the way across the top of the flat of the shank. Then I came back forward in diagonals a couple times. Really wanted to build some thread up here. And end up about one eye length behind the eye. So the only big difference between this pattern and the other one is it has more legs. So in this case, I'm using four silly legs and I'm not going to cut them in half. I'm going to use them full length. So I'm going to fold those over the thread again, center them up and loosely tie them on here. What happened to your tail? Oh, I'm lost. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Saturday morning. <laughs> I'm Sorry, suffering man. from post bike mechanic burnout. <laughs> I tell you, after you know working like several days in a row on just junk bikes, I just have nothing left. <laughs> so I'm using a much thicker bundle for a bigger fly. This what actually, if you were to compress it and stretch it, would be probably, I don't know, three quarters of pencil thickness, pretty substantial when it's not compressed. And again, I'm going to proportion it about the same. I'm gonna have my tail just a little shorter than the shank length in my material holding fingers, and then cut the material to where the thread ends on the front of the hook. So you end up with a piece. In this case, about an inch and three quarters. I'm gonna go ahead and tie it down just like the other material with a couple of loose pinch wraps to get it on here. And then really I want a big fat bundle to hold that foam. 
So that's a lot more material on that hook shank. You can really see it. This would probably work really well with bucktail because bucktail tends to build up really well on a hook. Um, I just have bought so much of this synthetic stuff that I have enough to last three or four fly tires a lifetime. So I really try to, when I can use it, use it. I'm never going to buy any more of it because I think I will die with stuff left. So now let's go back and put our legs on. Like I said, I have four and we're going to tie them on just like before, folding them over the thread, evening up the tips. and lightly binding them down. Three or four really light wraps. Getting equal numbers on either side of the hook shank, pulling them back. <laughs> my skin is, uh, my fingers is not helping. Okay, I didn't put it back. Never mind. Hi, Dad. And then, when you have them pulled back, wrapping over top a couple times to lock them in place, you can be a little bit more firm with that. Stop losing his keys. I didn't actually lose them. They were in the purse. Well, you didn't know where they were, so you technically did lose them. Only for a second. And then we're going to bring our thread back to our tie-in point for the tail. Yeah, excuse me. I can use both hands, so. When I broke my elbow, um, I started using my left hand more and more. I think I could be a lefty if I wanted to. All right, I got four legs on each side. And again, just like the other pre-cut body, fold it over so you form a crease in the fat point. And in the center of this crease, we're going to poke a hole with our scissors. Like that. Then, of course, since we don't have that little tab, it doesn't matter which side goes up. We push it on. And in this case, we're going to wrap the butt end, but since we don't have that tab of the top. <coughs> and with foam, you always start with loose wraps and get a little tighter once you get a few wraps on there. And there it's on. Then we flip the fly over I'm going to try and do this with the side facing the audience. Get all my legs to the front. And again, we're going to super glue it. I especially make sure there's plenty of super glue on the edges, the outside edge of the foam, so you can get the edges to bond, to bond together. Now I just want to make sure my legs are kind of to the front. Pinch it down. This is where thick skin helps. Thick oily skin does not stick to super glue as easily. My fingers don't seem to stick to it much at all because <laughs> I think my skin is completely rounded off from constantly scrubbing it with mechanics uh, soap. But my hands are rough and thick. I have to uh, take an emery board to my fingers so that uh, I can tie. And again, I'm gonna do a super glue finish. In this case, I did about two inches of thread And you just keep wrapping it so you build up a nice space and get most of the super glue off the thread. A 
cut it off. Somewhere I have a long whip finishing tool that I typically use for this, but uh, I'm kind of getting away from them and doing it more and more by hand. But I think with this flyer, with all the legs, it's kind of hard to whip finish and also use your fingers to keep the legs where they need to be. This model, instead of the legs being splayed, they're all basically in one line and they're a longer. You can always trim them to a desired length. I think, you know, the, the legs themselves, I've noticed with, you know, floating bugs, the legs themselves do all their work when it's sitting still. Any little currents or eddies in the water make these things just wiggle around, but they really don't do that much, I think, when you retrieve them. So I think at that point, a, a top water pattern is more about displacing water than anything. Does that make sense? Yep. Well, that's it. They're, qu they're quick and dirty. You can bust through these uh, pretty quick. Any questions? How thick is that foam? This is just the standard craft foam, two millimeter craft foam that you buy at like Joann's or Michael's or uh, uh, like Walmart. Like six, sixteenth of an inch or something like that. Yeah, it might be an eighth of an inch. Let's look. No, you're right. It's a sixteenth of an inch. Okay. I wish we had all converted to metric when we were little. <laughs> it would be so much easier. Though I have difficulty visualizing any metric value. I'm happy at work. Bikes use all metric fasteners except for pedals. Pedals are 9 16 thread. <laughs> 9 16 fine, of all things. And the only thing I know that uses 9 16 thread is an oil burner nozzle. But then you have the drive side has regular threads. The non-drive side has reverse threads, left-hand threads. So that when you pedal, both pedals tighten as you ride. All right. All right. But everything else is metric and it's mostly Allen head. Every once in a while, some fool will put Torx on there. But uh, I don't know what the size of the bolts are. I just know the size of the fat of the wrench that turns them. <laughs> so to me, you know, if a bolt uses a four millimeter Allen head, it's a four millimeter bolt. And it's not. It's actually a five or a six. All right. But then their thread pitches is like, you know, it's... Um, 0.7 threads per millimeter. Mm. Like, how can you? That's just crazy. Now, if you multiply it by 10, it makes more sense. Seven threads per centimeter. Right. Or you can have 15 threads per centimeter. That's their two. It's 0.7 and 1.5 is most stuff. But uh, yeah, it's uh, different. Wayne, while you were doing that, I was thinking about you know how we can't find any material. You know, I, th I think we ought to, we should have started with a book, you know, that says where the materials are. And every time you place something away, you should write it down. But by, by God, don't move, don't rearrange the house, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really trying not to buy anything else so I can organize what I have, but I'm really not very successful. Uh, none of us are. <laughs> no, that was sorry. Yeah. I just I was just went, thrilled I could find the hooks because yeah. I just don't tie a lot anymore. I just right. tie what I need instead of tying. I used to tie just for the joy of tying. And I, I probably tied, I don't know, several thousand flies of everything under the book. And you know, after a while, it's just like, well, I'm just gonna tie what I need. Yeah. And I used to do all the fly swaps and everything, and you know, I had all these fly swap, swap flies and boxes are displayed in shadow boxes. And I'm like, you know what? They're going in fly boxes and they're going in the water. Yeah. Yep. 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 You know, I, I was thinking about this swap, you know, what I'm going to do. I mean, I got, I got those big crates, you know, full of uh, marabou feathers. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when I had my shop, I bought them by the pound. Well, I don't know if you know what a pound of feathers are, but it's a big uh, bag. Right. It must and, be a, uh, a two-gallon bag or, you know, almost like a kitchen bag. Uh, oh, it's bigger than that. I oh, mean, wow. It, you, know, you know, so I, have, I don't know how I could 
I could take them over there and kind of sell them. I mean, we would have feathers all over the yard and lawn and everything else. So I don't know what I'm going to do with them. But I mean, I got every color under the rainbow when I had, had my shop, you know. I toured Wapsi once. And the volume is just stunning. <laughs> it's just, they show you how they die like, um, oh, let's say like chenille. Now they don't dye chenille, they dye other products because mm -hmm. um, they can buy their chenille from Danville already the way they want it. All right. Danville pretty much has the market on that. But let's say they they would, um, like ice chenille, they actually dye the ice chenille there mm -hmm. and they'll get it in like a hundred pound spool mm -hmm. and they'll kind of pressure dye it with heat and in almost like a giant pressure cooker. So you'll see this huge spool mm -hmm. of material go in there and they cook it from a recipe. So they're actually mixing the dyes from a recipe with the right proportions. And then they pull it out at a certain point and compare it to the master color and decide whether it needs to be a little longer or a little less, but it's this huge volume. And then they have a room that they unspool it like on like, like a hanging rack for no better word, this kind of bizarre looking and let it dry. Right. And then they re-spool it into bulk spools and then they take a bulk spool out and then they put it on whatever proportions they're going to sell. Right. So I was like, man, that's just way too much work. And then yep. they had a yep. room for receiving deer hides that yep. was about the size of a four car garage full of pelts. Don't doubt it a bit. Yeah. Oh, it had such a fragrant smell too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but well, just stuff like that. It was just stunning. Well, to see. I'm bringing a I'm bringing a whole whole box of bucktails. So. <laughs> have every flavor and such. You know, me being colorblind, they're all loose, so I don't know what half the colors are. <laughs> hey, Wayne, how long do you uh, leave these legs? Okay, so for the bass bug. Yeah. So I started with a five inch length of silly legs. That's how long silly legs are. Uh huh. And I just took four of them and folded them in half over the thread. So each side is like two and a half inches. Two and a half. Okay. You can trim them to whatever length you want. I typically leave things when I'm first trying it because I've never fished this before. I just thought it was an interesting pattern to try, especially for pan fish, because I normally fish a gurgle pop and a lot of times this gets swallowed. And if you read this guy's blog, this fly, because it's so big at the head, would be difficult for some of these small sunfish to swallow. And so you don't have to spend all your time with a pair of hemostats trying to retrieve a fly and, and rescue a, a sunfish to let it grow up. The whole idea is they can't get it and swallow it. Now, of course, with bass, they can swallow anything. Even crappy can get some pretty big lures in their mouth. <clears throat> crappy never cease to amaze me in what they'll, you know, the size of fly that they'll go after. Because I'll a lot of times catch them with bass sized flies. And they uh, hit super hard immediately and then they're done. And you're like, you thought you snagged something. And it's no, that's a crappy. <laughs> None of you have ever experienced that before. Yeah, I, well, I've, I've, I've seen them eat flukes. You know, they'll eat a, a three and a half inch fluke. Uh, and, yeah, I have no doubt. And, yeah, and uh, a stunted one that's probably three and a half to four inches long will do that. All right, all right. Well, that's how they get bigger. Yeah. <laughs> and the fact food. that they're stunted ones means there's too many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Years and years ago, I, I, I always, my dream was to have a, a property with five, about a five acre pond on it. And uh, so I started reading and, you know, talked to DNR about how to make a, you know, a good pond, what it required. And the, the thing that you don't understand or you don't think about is that for the, to have a pond, you know, balanced well, <clears throat> you, you, have to, you have to take out 25 pounds of, of, of uh, panfish for every pound of bass in the pond. Now that really seems like it's a, an exorbitant amount, but it, it it really isn't, you know. Well, panfish so, just reproduce too fast, and you'll see yeah. some of these yeah. old farm, you know, old old ponds. I'm, I used to call them farm ponds, but they were just like 
you know, some kind of naturally formed pond. And there'll be like one or two really, really big fish in one of these little puddles. And then everything else is just tiny. Yep. 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 That's why you should take bluegills home and eat them. <laughs> you know, we did a we did a thing on Unicorn Lake years ago. Um, I, I used to keep fishing records and uh, we decided that we were going to take bluegills out of Unicorn Lake. Every time we caught them, we we're going to take them home and eat them. So I don't remember the exact numbers, but we took over 1,200 bluegill out of Unicorn Lake in one year. And the next year, we took almost 900 out of the same body of water. So you're talking about at least 2,000 fish that we took out of that pond. And the following year, all the, all the yellow belly sunfish, all the pumpkin seeds, all the crappy were much, much bigger. So it just showed you, you know, that to manage a pond, even Unicorn Lake, which is what, 50 acres? I mean, you have to take a lot of panfish out of that lake to make that lake really a, a, an efficient lake. Um, so it, it's pretty amazing. You know, I, I just fished a little pond over Deer Park. You know, it's a wreck area and they got a, about an acre and a half in there. And, um, you know, I went over and played with the bluegills. Well, I couldn't catch anything bigger than six and a half inches. But I mean, there was, there was thousands and thousands of them in there. You know? you know, that'd be kind of a fun outing to kind of have a numbers competition. All right. Yeah. Just for fun. And then, you know, like you said, take them out to make the population bigger. Yeah. I mean, um, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, you're not gonna hurt hurt them by taking them out. You know, even even if you use yeah. them for fertilizer in your in your garden, you know, um, <clears throat> in the spring, I mean, they're good to eat. Their meat is real solid, uh, much much better. But uh, yeah, I know a lot of people have done that. You know, they they uh, they use them for fertilizer. You know, so yeah, you don't want a lot of cats around though, because they dig them all up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember being a kid and I was at a um, place called Patuxent Ponds in, in Arundel County. Yep, know where that's at. I used to fish them. Yeah. And um, uh, we used to ride there on our bikes, me and my friend. And we went there one winter day and we were catching bluegill like crazy, but they were all small. Mm -hmm. And there were these two stray cats. Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, let's feed these cats and see if they'll eat a fish. Well, about six or seven later. Yeah. We thought we were going to kill the cats because they ate, they would not stop because they probably hadn't <laughs> eaten in who knows how long. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, they, they ate themselves sick. It was, yeah. it was interesting. Yeah. You know, you know the, 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 the bad part about it, I don't know how you felt about it, but to hear them cats crunch that fish, you know, it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> kind of gives you chills when you hear that crunch, crunch, crunch. <laughs> an otter's the same way. Ever seen an otter catch catch and eat a fish? Oh God, yeah, yeah. yeah they crunch like like yeah. even worse than a cat. <laughs> I had I had one down. We were fishing on the Potomac, and uh, it, this uh, this otter had 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 grabbed a uh, a uh, uh, catfish, and and he came up to the boat to show me what he had, like he was proud of it. <laughs>